Hey guys, good morning. Merry Christmas. Nice to see you guys this morning. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn uh, to Galatians chapter 4. We're looking at just a few verses here this morning. And um, as you're turning there, let me just kind of remind you, it's probably up here as well, but uh, the, the title for my sermon this morning is, is kind of the, the big idea that I want to point you to as well. So uh, the title is God's Plan for Our Redemption. God's plan for our redemption. And as, as we look at Galatians 4 this morning, what we're going to see is how Paul lays out this plan, really, of Christmas. So the reason why we have hope uh, during the season of Christmas is found in these verses in Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. Um, and so it kind of frames that out. So let me read this to you, and uh, we'll, we'll jump in with uh, the rest of our, our sermon here. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive, uh, so that we might receive adoption as sons. You know, I, I think that uh, planning sometimes can be difficult. In, in fact, it's, it's hard to plan for every eventuality, absolutely. Um, Mike Tyson once said, uh, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. Right? I'm, I've never been punched in the mouth before. Maybe you have. Hopefully you haven't. But I can imagine that that would be disorienting. And if anything, the last 18 months or so has been disorienting. It's been this reminder that for all of our plans and all of our contingencies and all the things that we kind of have lined up, um, in many ways, we could never see the last 18 months coming. And uh, it's hard. It's hard to, to be the one who makes the plan. Some of you will sit in your car after service for 20 minutes and talk about where do you want to go to lunch? I don't know. Where do you want to go to lunch? And, and it's hard to kind of land on, on that in some ways. So this morning, though, I, I want to point us to not our plans. This, this week has lots of things going on, I'm sure, in your life, planning for uh, Christmas coming up very soon, uh, but to God's plans and to consider what is God's plan for humanity? What is God's plan? for us as believers, and Paul shares it pretty explicitly here. And what I want to point you to this morning is kind of the, the when, the how, and the why of God's plan for Christmas, God's plan for redeeming his people. Um, and so as we look at Galatians 4, that's what we really see here. And so there's really three points to this. So the number one thing I want you to see is, is the when. When does this plan kind of take place? And if you look at Galatians 4, Paul says, uh, but when the fullness of time had come. Let's talk about this for a little bit, this idea of time. Paul uses this phrase, the fullness of time. When all the time that was supposed to pass came to pass, then God put his plans in motion. I mentioned Christmas already. There's seven days left to Christmas. That's a, it's about 168 hours to accomplish all that you have to accomplish. You still have to probably do some last-minute shopping. Uh, there's probably some presents that have to be wrapped. There's food that has to be purchased. Hopefully, I'm not giving you an anxiety attack as I'm talking about these things. But th there, there is limited, right? Time is limited. This is a busy week. There's lots to do each week, but especially this week. Well, not only is time limited in quantity, but timing is equally important. How we strategically spend the time that we're, we're given is equally important. Timing is important. Uh, I, like many of you guys, I, I, Katie and I started a, um, a, gar a garden during quarantine. Uh, the last 18 months, we kind of tried our hand at gardening, and we realized very quickly that there are certain vegetables that you don't want to plant at certain times of the year. Right, like tomatoes are just really kind of hard to plant unless you like plant them at the right time. And those of you who have a green thumb know that. There are certain things about timing in regards to that. You don't start a diet after Halloween. Just not wise, right? You start a diet after New Year's like everybody else, right? You start working out after New Year's like everybody else. You don't re-roof a house in the winter. You do that in the spring or the summer. Why? Because it's not the right time. There's, there's a right time to each of these things. Think about the timing in sports. Many of you are, are, are fans of basketball, and so you see these, you know, all oops, right? Like, uh, the very fact that someone could throw a ball towards the hoop and have somebody else dunk it, kind of all line up at the same time, that's kind of amazing that they time it that way, right? I could never do that for obvious reasons, but there's, there's a, a sense of speed and skill and most important timing. If you were to try to hit a baseball in the major leagues, it would require some amazing timing and skill and, and all that. 
Think about the way that you guys got to church today. Maybe there was a, a rush of time. Maybe something came up last minute where your kids needed something or you forgot your keys. All these things kind of have to do with the way that we arrive to where we're supposed to arrive at the right time. Timing is so important. It matters in so many ways. And what I want to point you to this morning in this first point is that God's timing is perfect. His timing for us, his timing in his plan for salvation for us is absolutely perfect. In fact, Galatians 4.4, in many ways, it's the fulfillment of a beautiful promise that was made generations ago. Genesis, I mean, Galatians 4.4 4 is the fulfillment of uh, about 300 prophecies about Christmas, um, but it's really the fulfillment of one important promise, that, that one day, this, this one, this baby, this savior would be born to us, uh, born in a manger, and who would end up being the centerpiece of the gospel, the main character of the whole story arc of Christmas, of the Bible, of everything we read in scripture, Jesus is the main character. And so Genesis 3 tells us that uh, the relationship that humanity had had between, between us and uh, creator God had been fractured. And God could have could have kind of wiped us out and said, all right, mess that up, That's, let's reset, let's start that again. But he decided instead to redeem humanity and to make a way for humankind to be redeemed. So Genesis 3.15 reads this, and, and I will cause hostility between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This, this verse in Genesis 3.15 is a very important verse. In fact, it's one of the most important verses in all scripture because it sets up this precedent for, for everything else that happens in scripture. It kind of points back to this promise that God makes to the enemy and to Adam and Eve saying that one day there will be a redeemer. There will be a, a, a savior that will be born to you who will, will right all the wrongs made on, on this day in Genesis 3.15. And it creates this expectation all throughout the rest of the Bible, of a redeemer. And so the question obviously arises, when would this offspring be born? When would this redeemer uh, come to fruition? When, when would the enemy finally be crushed? When is this going to all happen according to God's plan? And so if you, if you read your Old Testament, you see these small glimpses of the redeemer all throughout the Old Testament. We walked through Exodus the last year and a half. We're still kind of walking through our way through that. And as we do so, we, we know the stories. We see how Moses was in a way a redeemer. He would redeem the people of Israel out of, out of slavery from Egypt. And it's just a reminder that, oh, that, that's what God does for us. That's what God is going to do for us. The judges in the Old Testament point to his justice the kings of the Old Testament point to his power. The, the minor and major prophets of the Old Testament point explicitly to his suffering and to his ministry and to his life here on earth. And so when Jesus was born, the timing was exactly right. Exactly right. And we know this, Christian, theologically, because we, we believe that God is all-powerful, that he has all wisdom, he has all knowledge, he never makes a mistake. And so we understand that from a theological standpoint. But what I also want to point to you to this, this morning is that Jesus was also born at exactly the right time historically. In, in fact, all these things kind of lined up in order for Jesus to be born, for the gospel to be shared, and for Christianity to start in this, in this way. The time was right culturally. The time was right culturally. Uh, leading up to Jesus' birth, there were many languages. Many people spoke languages in this area, and it started to whittle down more and more where it was Latin and Greek, and specifically Koine Greek, which is the common language of that day. And so everybody would speak this way and be understood. And it's something that we kind of take for granted here uh, in the States, but sometimes we run into folks who speak other languages, and there's this frustration point, this moment of like, oh, we have to kind of take our time here and figure out how to communicate this, this truth. But sharing the gospel from this point on, because Jesus was born at this time, became easier because everyone spoke Koine Greek. Uh, I, I've been in different countries before where, you know, sharing the gospel in Africa, in Kenya, is, it just takes longer than sharing the gospel in Ireland. Because even though, you know, we speak a little differently than the Irish do, we can still kind of have a relationship and, and kind of start talking about spiritual things right away. It's amazing. And so the timing was right culturally. The time was right politically. 
When Jesus came for, uh, f- for us, uh, the time was right politically. Some of you have heard of the Pax Romana before, the, this time of the Roman peace, where because of the way that politics were at the time, because of who was in charge, there was really, uh, this was a very peaceful time for those who lived in the Roman Empire that all those who, who lived there were protected as citizens of Rome. And so as a result of that, there just was less crime. There was less fighting. There weren't wars happening at this time. In addition, the Roman roads are still uh, used to this day that were established at this time, right? These Roman roads that kind of all, all roads lead to Rome, there's this sense of like, man, these roads were built to last forever, way better than our California roads for sure. But like uh, some of you have been to places, I've been to Lebanon before and in, in, inside an entire where you could still see these Roman roads that are being used to this day. And that was happening at this time. And then finally, the time was right religiously, The time was right religiously. The Jews had just finished the Old Testament canon. They had just established the synagogue system for school and for justice and for for worship to happen. And there was all this pent-up demand for uh, for, for a monotheistic religion. They were tired of doing all these ritual sacrifices for this God over here, that God over there. And so there was this anticipation of the one Messiah who would come to to rule and to reign um, in these, these Roman times. The time was right religiously. And so when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son for us. And the timing was, was perfect politically, culturally, religiously for the good news, for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be, to be set free, to spark and set fire to the world, for everyone to hear about who Jesus was. The next part of God's plan becomes clear. We have the when, when the fullness of time had come, but how? How? How would this be accomplished? How would this be accomplished? Well, let's keep reading here in Galatians 4, verse 4. It says this, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. Born of woman, born under the law. So how did this happen? Well, the first thing I want to point out here in Galatians 4, the second part of uh, verse 4, is is the pre-existence of the son. This is an important part of of our theology. This is an important part of how we see Jesus the preexistence of the son. Jesus was not created, okay? There was no start date. He, was, he, he is an eternal God. He, he's been there since the beginning. He was there at the, the, the forming of the earth, at the creation of all things. And so that's why we read, God sent forth his son. It doesn't say God created his son and then sent him forth. It says God sent forth his son. He stepped out of eternity and he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of, of men. This is who Jesus was, and this is how he was sent out for us on our behalf. But it also says in Galatians that he was born of woman. Now, why does it say that? Is that important? Is that necessary for us to know that? What is, what is Paul talking about here? And there's, there's a sense here, uh, some theologians may wonder like, hey, uh, are we talking about the Virgin Mary? like born of, of that woman specifically. And that is absolutely true. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. But uh, th- that's not exactly what we're talking about. Although it is interesting, um, the Roman Catholic Church venerated Mary for so many years. In fact, um, many of us as Protestants, it's all of us in this room, re- have kind of failed to rejoice over this godly woman who is Mary. Mary was courageous, Mary wanted God's will in her life. Mary was willing to kind of endure whispers and kind of talk behind her back for the rest of her life about her morality and about her choices, all to be in the center of God's will. And so while Mary is, is absolutely worthy of, of honor in some ways, that's not what Paul is talking about here. Paul doesn't say Jesus was born of the Mar- Virgin Mary. He says that he was born of woman. Because Paul, what he's doing here is he's highlighting the humanity of Jesus. That's the key thing we're supposed to take away from that verse. Born of woman, the fact that he was just like us, that he was fully God and fully man. The fancy term for this is the hypostatic union, meaning basically that he's 100% God and 100% man at the same time. And and the bottom line for this is that the reason that Jesus was needed in this way was because humankind needed a a clearer, a better picture of a man. Because Adam had failed. Moses had failed. King David had failed. 
And so we needed a, a better version uh, that would point to a perfect God. Jesus was that perfect God who became the perfect man. Ephesians 2.15 says this, Jesus abolished the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. This is what Jesus did on our behalf. He made peace for us by becoming that one new man. The divinity of Jesus means, as I mentioned, that Christ was there at the creation of of the world. He, he knows everything about us. He knows every thought that you have. He knows everything that you think. He's completely sovereign over, over all. But the, the humanity of Jesus means that Jesus became flesh and he, he died, he suffered, he, he had pain, he had joy, he was tempted, he was made to struggle, but yet he, he didn't give in a temptation. Even though he experienced extreme despair, he didn't give in to temptation. And so not only was Jesus born of woman, but he was born under the law. Let's look at this next part. Why is this important? Jesus Christ was born and lived under the law just like us. So what does that mean? That means all the moral and ethical obligations we have to God. Uh, we, we just walked through the Ten Commandments right before the holidays. And so think about this. All of those commandments, all of those, that law that was handed down from God, down to Moses, down to the Israelites, Jesus was also subject to obey all those laws. Uh, he, he was called to not steal, to not uh, take the Lord's name in vain, to, to not kill, all those things that we also are on the hook for. And, and here's the deal. Uh, we break the law all the time. Some of you have broken God's law on the way to church this morning, right? Uh, some of you have, maybe were, were angry or you lashed out in frustration or maybe there was lust or maybe there was some issue that's already come up even for you even this morning. But Christ didn't break the law in any way. And what's equally important is that Christ didn't get a pass. He wasn't given some special forgiveness. The, the moral laws of the universe weighed completely on him too. Hebrews 5.8 says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. The suffering of Jesus' experience led him to obedience. Why is this important? Well, why is it important that Jesus Christ was born of woman and yet born under the law? Why is this relevant for us as we consider this gift to us? Well, what it does, Paul reminds us, is that it gives Jesus legitimacy, Jesus was legit in that he experienced all the things that we experience. It, it, it couldn't have been any other, any other way. In fact, kind of imagine this. Imagine you guys have heard of a Navy SEAL training, BUDS training, right? So it's like 24 weeks of suffering and training and, and pain and, and all these things that if you want to be a Navy SEAL, you have to go through this specific training. Everyone has to do it. And I don't know what the pass fill rate is, but it's pretty, it's pretty low. Uh, that many people uh, fail out of this. Now imagine for a second if the, the head admiral in the Navy said, hey, I have a son. He's in the Navy. He's a solid guy. I'd like for him to be a Navy SEAL. But he doesn't have to experience BUDS training. Can you imagine how frustrated the rest of the soldiers would be? Everybody would be resentful. Everybody would be frustrated and angry that, that well, why doesn't he have to do this thing that, that everybody else has to do? And in some ways, going through that suffering, going through that training, going through that whole experience, that 24, 24 weeks, it really legitimizes the, the soldiers who go through that program. It's like, hey, you're a Navy SEAL. You, you have uh, experienced all that everyone else has experienced, and you've passed the test, and you are legitimate. And this is what Jesus did through his experience here on earth, born of woman, born under the law. And God said, look, this is the only way that this can happen, that we would uh, have a savior who has experienced all that we've experienced. And this is how God accomplished his plan. This is how God accomplished his plan. In the fullness of time, he sent his son to become human like you and me who faced every plight, every challenge, every issue that you and I do. He was held accountable to the law, morally and spiritual, spiritually, and yet he was completely obedient, completely perfect. And it finally brings us to our last point. Why? Why did he do this? Why did God's plan uh, work this way? We turn back to Galatians 4, verse 5. It says this, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. 
to redeem those, that's, that's us, we were under the law, so that we, church, might receive adoption as sons. So this is the purpose. This is why God laid his plan out in this way. In verse 5, what it shows is there's a shift. There's this fundamental shift in legal standing almost in how God viewed us before Christ and after Christ. And because of Christ coming to us, he views us differently than he used to, to redeem those under the law. The, the word redeem is, is kind of a freedom word. It's a, it's a word that draws to uh, being set free. And Jesus set us free because we couldn't keep that law. We were unable to do so. Even, not only in our actions, but even in our hearts. We, uh, we know this from Matthew 5, that in our hearts, evil lurks. Evil is always ready to, to lash out and do its worst. But instead, we don't receive the law any longer as Christians. We receive adoption. And, and I would submit to you this morning that that was, that was the real motivation of, of Jesus Christ was to give us uh, this status as sons of adoption, um, really in his plan, in, in that part of his plan. Now, some of you may be wondering, as you look at uh, Galatians 4 verse 5, is this really what Paul means here in terms of this word sons? Because maybe you're like thinking, well, you probably mean sons and daughters, right? That's, that's probably fine. And, and uh, just, just to clear the air, that's not what Paul means. He uses the word sons very intentionally here. And it doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't, you know, supportive of women. He absolutely cared for and loved uh, women in his ministry and, and helped support them and, and gave them all they need. God's plan is obviously for all people. It's for men and women. It's for all races, but specifically here in Galatians 4 verse 5, we see the use of the word sons very intentionally. Because in Roman society, uh, the son inherits the position and the property and the name and the titles. It is the son who does this. And so this isn't a, a, a value statement made uh, from God about the value of men and women. That's not what this is about. This is a, a cultural remark about, hey, um, Galatians, look, it's kind of like when somebody gets adopted and they receive everything that that firstborn son would get as a result of that adoption. And so the use of the word sons is contingent on adoption. And if you were to adopt a full-grown servant, they would receive everything promised to the male heir, right? So name, position, possessions. And so the use of the word sons here points to an absolute inheritance that we also get in on as Christians today. You see, church, we cannot earn a better position before God because a better position does not exist. This is what we inherit as sons and daughters of, of God. We inherit all the benefits of sonship. You can't find a better position because if you're in Christ, you already have the most supreme position available. You have the same, same position as the Son, Jesus Christ. So as we start to close this up here, let me connect some of the dots of application for us this morning. This plan of redemption produces change in our hearts. It should produce a new way to live in many ways. And so here are three things as we close. Number one, be patient and trust God's plan. Be patient and trust God's plan. I know many of you, like me, probably have a hard time being patient. Uh, a, a, lot, a lot of you, uh, like me, have a hard time trusting uh, a plan that maybe we didn't invent or start. But let me remind you of this glorious conditional statement uh, from, our, from our kind of study this morning that applies to every believer in this room. If God can be trusted with providing salvation, then he can certainly be trusted with our lives. If God can be trusted with the most fragile, important, eternal thing that you and I will ever kind of brush up against, our own salvation, our own eternal life, if God can be trusted with that, then he can certainly be trusted with the rest of our stuff. And so I don't know where you're at this morning in terms of your waiting, your mistrust of the people around you, but you can trust God's plan. You can trust God's plan. You can trust his timeline. And listen, I didn't say that you can know God's timeline. That's different. But you can trust God's timeline. And his timeline might be different than what you're expecting. But because we look back at 
passages like this, because we read the rest of our Bible and we see God's character and how it is good and generous and, and kind to us, he's gracious to us, we can trust his plan. And so if you're in a waiting season uh, this Advent, if you're in this kind of cycle of, of waiting, welcome to the club, right? Well, welcome to this portion of the church calendar that pats you on the back and says, hey, we're all experiencing the same thing. We are all waiting for something that is greater, uh, something that is to come in the future, patiently waiting on God's plan for our life. Uh, secondly, as far as application goes, number two, be thankful. Are you a thankful Christian? Are you a Christian who is grateful for what you've been given? This is something that I have to remind myself often. I can tend to be a little bit uh, a glass half empty in, in some ways, but are, are you thankful for this, this truth that you are now sons of adoption? And if so, we ought to worship differently. We ought to raise our hands in worship. We ought to bow in humility, realizing that we didn't deserve Jesus Christ, and yet that's exactly who we were given. It should produce gratefulness in our hearts. And then finally, number three is, is this. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. I think it's also from the Lion King, but it also applies here, okay? <laughs> Remember who you are. You, you are not just some guy, some gal trying to make their way through this world. You're, you're not somebody who's simply just trying their best during the holidays. That's, that's not your story. God sent Jesus to adopt you into his family, to advocate for you. And so your identity is in Christ. Your inheritance is because of Christ. You have access to the God of the universe. And so really practically, that means that when you pray to God, he hears you. Isn't that amazing? That when you speak words to the creator of the universe, that he hears you and he will respond to you in his timing. And just like any loving father, he, he wants good things for you. And so listen, maybe Christmas is a season where you are reminded, perhaps, uh, perhaps painfully reminded, that your family is not that great. Uh, you know, in a room like this, oh, don't point to people or anything, okay? Just, just, this is a hypothetical. But in a room this size, there, there, I'm sure there are fractured relationships. There are people who are, are, are frustrated, and so they have to be reminded of being around the same table uh, every single time around this year, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and it's painful. I, I realize that. Maybe you're alone this Christmas. Maybe people have, have, have passed away, even during, for COVID or other reasons. Maybe you find yourself to be far away uh, from family in this season. But remember that because God sent his son for us, we have been adopted into the family of God. And so just, just for a second, turn to your right and left, just look around. Look around who's, who's around you right now. These are brothers and sisters in Christ because you have been adopted into the family of God. And so we rejoice. We remember who we are. And so at the fullness of time, God sent his son. And one day when the time is right again, he will come back. It's what the book of Hebrews says in chapter 9. He will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, that's already been accomplished, but to, to, to bring his people home and to save those of us or heal those, those of us, to restore us who are, are, are broken in many ways, who are eagerly longing uh, for his, his return. This is God's plan for our redemption. It's, it's perfect, it's timely, and it's for everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. God, we, we thank you for your care for us this morning. We thank you for your sovereign plan of salvation that you had, uh, had in mind for us since the beginning, that you cared enough to put this plan into motion. We didn't deserve it, and yet, here we are, Lord, we, we're receiving it. And so, thank you for Christmas and for the ways that you remind us of your generosity and your grace to us in this season. Lord, help us to live differently because we are yours. We pray this in your name. Amen.